Hello again, one and all. It's me, Matt. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for joining me on today's video. We are discussing self-propelled artillery once again, and as a gunner, I always have a strong fascination in anything that is an artillery piece. And we're going to the world of Russia to learn about the Gazvika, which is basically a self-propelled gun cross tank cross BMP. That's really the closest explanation I can give you an all-round summary of this cool little vehicle. Now, if you know anything about self-propelled guns, you'll know that the key about having a self-propelled gun is being able to shoot and scoot quickly and putting rounds down range. And when I talk about shoot and scoot, this thing really does pull the scoot out of the bag. It is a BMP, basically, with an artillery piece placed upon it. Very, very nimble, very, very agile in getting across the battlefield and packs quite the punch. So let's talk a little bit about this vehicle. So the Govdika, otherwise known as Carnation, was developed in Kharkov as a means to provide Soviet unions with mobile firepower intended to destroy enemy manpower, artillery and fortifications. Its development was, interestingly enough, inspired by Western designs, unlike the Americans though, who learned the value of indirect mobile artillery very early on, the Soviets actually preferred direct fire infantry support from Second World War onwards, and the departure from this was a philosophy that took nearly two decades. The late war and post-war Soviet assault guns such as the ISU-152 were usually well armoured, packed quite a bit of punch and were also capable of indirect fire, but were not exactly mobile, and of course, as I mentioned, self-propelled guns need to be able to shoot and scoot across the battlefield very, very quickly. Now, we're not just talking about the 2S1 today, we're talking about all models that come under the self-propelled artillery focus of this small little platform that's been modified during its time. Russia learned very quickly that self-propelled guns, whether tracked or on wheels, is definitely the way forward for their artillery pieces when it comes to indirect fire with projectiles instead of rockets. While lightly armoured self-propelled guns were developed in the Soviet Union even before the war, the events of the war, as well as the traditional Soviet officers, and of course the price of such vehicles compared to simple towed artillery, slowed the development process considerably. On the other hand though, with the onset of the atomic age, tactical, small-yield nuclear weapons became a reality. One of the main arguments in favour of self-propelled guns was the fact that they could be made NBC-proof over pressurising the hull, whereas of course self-propelled artillery took the advantage over the indirect or normal towed artillery units because they were exceptionally vulnerable to such weapons, such as chemical, nuclear, biological, as well as some of the prime targets for their use. The situation changed after trials held in 1965 in the Soviet Union that were to determine the combat value of World War II era self-propelled guns such as the Su-100 and the ISU-152 on a modern battlefield. These trials have shown the inferiority of self-propelled Soviet guns to those used of NATO and on the 4th of July 1967, decision number 609-021, yes there is actually statement decision plans given, which were taken by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union to develop a new 122mm self-propelled gun for the Soviet military. The preliminary work was really there to determine the shape, the general shape of the vehicle. Its characteristics of the upcoming vehicle was actually conducted by the VN11-100 Technical Institute. They proposed three different chassis variants for the new gun. The Object 124 chassis, which was derived from the older Object 105, otherwise known as the SU-100P, the MTLB armoured transport chassis, and the BMP chassis. All three variants were supposed to be armed with the 122mm infamous D-30 gun. During the development, it was found that the Object 124 chassis was much too bulky and heavy, and the self-propelled gun would lose any chance of becoming amphibious. And of course, amphibious capabilities for the Russians was a huge primary directive for most of the military during that time. Much like the BMP development, the Soviets would consider amphibious capability to be the utmost importance, although history has shown that the dubious value of insisting on this trait is at the expense of many other vehicle features. We can talk about the BMP all day, and if you wish to, you can go check out my other videos, but of course, one of the key features of the BMP is that it's amphibious, but the also problem with that is it reduces its overall capability of armor protection due to it cannot be too darn heavy. The MTLB chassis, on the other hand, was too flimsy and unstable, making accurate fire completely impossible. The BMP-1 chassis was evaluated as acceptable, but P.P. Esakov, designer of the BMP, 
used his influence to forbid the self-propelled gun designers from using the beautiful BMP-1 chassis as a basis for the vehicle, and the same ban applied for all other derived vehicles that proposed on the BMP chassis due to production streamlining efforts. In the end, it was decided to use the modified prolonged chassis of the MTLB Armoured Transport. The resulting project received the GRAU designation 2S1 and was nicknamed the Govdika. It was intended to serve in artillery divisions of motorised infantry regiments, replacing the M30 and D30 towed howitzers. The Kharkov tractor plant was selected as the main developer of the self-propelled gun, and the gun for it, the 122mm 2A31, and was developed by OKB9 Design Bureau in today Ekaterinburg. The first four prototypes were ready and tested in 1969. The tests revealed a number of flaws, however, including excessively high concentrations of fumes inside the crew compartment, the same issue that plagued the heavier 2S3 Akasia, which is also some of the footage that you're seeing in this video. To alleviate this issue, the designers attempted to replace the unitary shells with a separate shell and charges, but the situation still did not improve, and the matter had to actually be solved by another means in the end, namely the installation of an improved fume ejector. The results became satisfactory, not perfect, but satisfactory. And after this improvement, the 2S1 Govdika was accepted officially into service on the 14th of September, 1971. An air mobile parachute deployed platform of this vehicle was developed as well, but unlike the vehicle itself, it was never accepted into service due to the parallel development of a dedicated paratrooper self-propelled gun called the 2S2 Falaka, or Violet. The mass production of the 2S1 ran from 1971 until 1991. The vehicle was also licensed and produced in Poland from 1971 and Bulgaria from 1979, with more than 10,000 made. It participated in many major conflicts such as the Afghanistan War, the Iran-Iraq War, the Civil War in Yugoslavia, and is currently still being used today in Syria and Ukraine, where a number of the vehicles were successfully deployed in direct fire roles as improvised tank killers. Basically, these can be turned into tanks if necessary. 122mm rounds being projected forwards is enough damage to knock out a tank. It's not their primary focus, it's not really what most of the vehicle crews are wanting to do with these things, because you do not want to be engaging another tank with this thing. It is, at the end of the day, a lightly skinned vehicle, but it does have the, you know, the capacity to do it if it really, really needed to. Throughout its lifespan, the vehicle underwent several modernizations both in Russia and abroad, and the best known of which being the Polish Goznik, which is equipped with a modernized Topaz fire control system and the Rack 120 120mm mortar on the Goznika chassis. Other versions, such as the Iranian Rad, also exist as well. The gun itself, the D32 122mm rifled howitzer, is a modified variant of the D30 towed howitzer. It's fitted with a load assisting system. The maximum rate of fire is 4 to 5 rounds per minute, which is pretty acceptable for a large round like that. The vehicle is also compatible with the 122mm munitions developed for all variants of the D30 howitzer. These include fragmentation, high explosive fragmentation, high explosive anti-tank, cluster, smoke and illumination projectiles. A total of 40 rounds are carried usually, 35 HE frag and 5 heat, just in case you come across a tank. Maximum range of fire for the HE frag projectile is around 15.2 kilometers. The vehicle has a crew of four, including commander, gunner, loader, and driver. And additionally, normally a backup vehicle, normally a BMP or another MTLB, will require a crew of normally about four or five to replenish the vehicle with rounds if necessary. The hull and turret are of welded steel armor construction. Protection is against very small arms fire and some artillery shell splinters, but the ideal is it's very soft skin. There isn't much room there. There's some exposed fuel tanks. It's it's not the greatest for protection, but then again, it shouldn't really be in that realm. It should be in the artillery realm and should be in a safe enough location to shoot and fire and get out of there. That's the whole purpose. They shouldn't be getting indirect fire back, but if they do, they are capable of you know holding off at least most indirect fire projectiles. The vehicle is based on the MTLB multi-purpose armoured vehicle chassis and is powered by the YAMS, and that's as best as I can say it, 238V diesel engine, developing 240 horsepower, and the vehicle is very good in water. 
Though the ammunition load has to be reduced to around 30 rounds though if it wants to swim in order to cross rivers and lakes afloat. The vehicle on water is propelled by its tracks, not propellers or, or motors, and the maximum speed on water is 4.5 kilometers an hour. It can be airlifted by an AN-12, an IL-76, and potentially a C-130, or similar military transport available. The 2S-1 was further developed into more useful battlefield roles for the Red Army and its other operators. This included such types as a mine clearer and chemical reconnaissance vehicle. Other nations have taken the 2S1 design steps and further produced more to a more custom-minded battlefield solution such as those supporting guided anti-tank missiles or utilizing commonality of parts with other chassis systems. In the Red Army service, the 2S1 was formally replaced by the 2S9 and 2S19 series of self-propelled guns. The phase-out process of existing 2S1s began in 2007. Other former operators of this type included the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Slovenia, Yugoslavia, and these are some of the reserve status vehicles that were passed on to other successor states. In the case of East German 2S1s, they were phased out of service in 1990, following the reunification of the country from its East and West post-World War II components. The largest operators of the 2S1, beyond the Soviet Union of course, became Ukraine, Bulgaria, Belarus, Poland, and India, each utilizing hundreds of the type in their own respective services. At least 70 2S1s served with the Finnish army under the designation of the 122 PSH-74. Well, there you have it everyone, quite an impressive little shoot and scoot capability self-propelled gun. I absolutely love the fact that this thing is amphibious as a self-propelled gun. You never would expect it really, I mean you think of like the M109, the AS90, you know, the PZH2000, big old beastly self-propelled guns with those 155mm guns. This is running a 122, still very capable projectile hitting the ground, uh, either direct fire or indirect fire. That is really impressive um of course its protection is lacking uh however it can do all sorts of things crossing rivers uh, be picked up by planes can you imagine trying to put an as-19 inside of a plane and dropping it off into a battle group not going to happen so a very impressive vehicle overall uh they're still obviously being utilized all over the world from many different nations and countries kind of a testament to the fact that people still want to use them although russia is kind of negated using them as much anymore they've upgraded some more sort of heavy duty equipment but uh, there's still a formidable weapon system to use in the artillery world and uh, i can tell you this much i wouldn't want to be coming up against a battery of them for sure if you enjoyed today's video folks please hit that little thumb button i appreciate it so much when you guys hit the like button because it helps me get my channel into the realm of youtube where they're like oh actually his content isn't too bad and i'm not gonna you know create this damning effect on youtube and the world of you know, military, uh, you know, content, which they're not too happy about. Of course, YouTube is just going out. Oh, this is going insane right now, this whole copper thing. But um, I hope you're uh, enjoying my content. So please leave me that like. Also, leave me a comment. Let me know what you want to see next. Other vehicles, other platforms, weapon systems. I'll try my best to get around to them. I know many of you leave me comments, so I'm not ignoring you. I will get around to them. I have a very long list, but just keep adding stuff, and I promise I'll put it on the list and get around to it sometime in the future. Um, thank you to everyone once again for supporting me on Patreon, my support page there. The donations you've been giving me towards that have been absolutely fantastic because it allows me to uh, focus on getting new equipment, sort of lighting and webcam and you know microphone and all the other bits and pieces that I need to get um, to actually record this footage and also to allow myself to uh, to review stuff because a lot of you have been asking me to look at you know equipment um, that I actually use in my day to day military life a reservist so if you want me to look at stuff like that again let me know in the comment section below what you would like me to do maybe I can see if I can purchase it and uh, do some reviews on it check out the description box below for all the other links and good stuff and uh, I hope to see you again on the next video have a wonderful day folks bye bye